You're listening to More Than a Song, episode 183. And welcome to this episode of More Than a Song. My name is Michelle Nizat, and this is the podcast dedicated to helping you discover the truth of Scripture, hidden in today's popular Christian music. My goal is to teach you to connect portions of God's Word with the songs they're singing along with on the radio, to help you meditate on truths that will transform your way of thinking and ultimately your life. This week, we will be jumping back into the Psalms. They are often natural places for today's songs to lead us because, well, they're songs too. So when my daughter Emily suggested for King and Country's Oh God Forgive Us and then texted me Psalm 79, well, we had our inspiration. So before we jump into Psalm 79, let's listen. We're praying the prayer with no reply. Words float off into the night. Couldn't cut out time with the sharpest knife. Oh, oh, God, forgive us. Silence isn't comfortable. We won't drive through peace and instant hope. A shallow faith that has left us broke. As I mentioned, Psalm 79 is a song. It is a song, however, that reflects the issues of the day. So it's about Jerusalem being brought down to ruin and the prayer of the psalmist that the enemies get what they deserve. And then tucked in the song is a prayer for mercy and forgiveness. And that, of course, is what led my daughter to suggest it to begin with. Now, I want to make a comment here. Because my podcast is inspired by music, I read a lot of commentary about Christian music. And some people are very critical of any song that doesn't explicitly share the gospel. I find myself sometimes getting critical myself of the seemingly self-focused direction of music overall versus it being really God-centered. Some want to honor God uh, in the secular world and write music that is uh, more appealing to what is currently known as like crossover music. And over the past couple of years, because of my voracious reading and theology-based study just for this podcast, I've been able to catch more and more of the lyrics being just a little off as to what the Bible actually teaches. Now, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this topic because all I want you to do is to read your Bible more. And while I want you to be very discerning in the music that you choose to listen to you, to listen to, I want to issue the warning that I've issued in the past, which is whatever you do, don't let Christian music be the only Bible you read or listen to. So I love this week's song because it and the video are very reflective of our times. And if we criticized every song that was written and that was reflective of the times, then we'd throw out Psalm 79 too. So what can we do to understand Psalm 79 in our time? That's our question for today. So I use the Bible interaction tool exercise of considering the big themes of this psalm. In fact, it almost works out like an outline. So verses 1 through 4... The psalmist pours out his complaint. And then in verses 5 through 12, he presents a prayer. And then in the closing verse, praise is promised. Complain, pray, praise. Not a bad outline for a song, right? Now, I call my Bible interaction tool exercises bites because they help us take a bite out of scripture. And this week, I also used the bite of writing out scripture one verse at a time. Now, This helps me slow down. I I find when I'm very distracted um, or I tend to read fast and, and, and just try to get it over with that this helps me slow down a little bit. 
It also helps me look at the words closely. And I also use the bite of asking questions. And I found that the psalmist uses this bite this week too. So it's only natural that we do the same. And then finally, I used an outside resource. A while back, and when, when reviewing one of the psalms that I did on the podcast, I purchased Spurgeon's The Treasury of David, which unpacks every single psalm. And If you bought the physical version, it's quite a few volumes, but I bought it on Kindle and it wasn't even that expensive and then it's super easy and it doesn't take up half a bookshelf. And so I really consider it a gem and I often use it when preparing for my podcast and studying the Psalms. So let's jump in. All right. Verse one says, Oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. Now, remember, the first four verses are going to lay out the complaint. And while we aren't living in these times, we do have our own invaders, don't we? What are today's invaders? That was one of the questions that I asked myself this week. And I'm asking you to ask it as well. You see, we are the temple of the Lord now. So what invaders have defiled God's holy temple? I wrote down a few, but you could probably add some to your own list. I wrote down greed, guilt, anger, and jealousy. Our song adds a couple. It says, slaves to our uncertainty help us with our unbelief. Perhaps unbelief is an invader. You see, these invaders, they tear us down from the inside out, brick by brick, until we are rendered ineffective Instead of a beautiful inheritance displaying the glory of the Lord, we become a broken down heap of rubble. And of the invaders, Spurgeon writes, after devouring and defiling, they have come to destroying and have done their work with a cruel completeness. The invaders of today's holy temple are no less fixated on complete destruction of God's inheritance. So it's, it behooves us to be very aware of these invaders. Verse 2, they have left the dead bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the sky, the flesh of your own people, for the animals of the wild. The psalmist really is making his case here. Did you hear it? Your inheritance, your temple, your servants, your saints, your people. He knew who they were in the eyes of God. Do do you know that you are God's inheritance? Do you understand that you are his temple? Do you identify as his servant? It's hard for us to understand that we are his saints as believers in Christ. So when approaching God with our complaint, (laughs) I can see the value of this deep awareness of who we are in him. A deep awareness of our identity. And for the next two verses, we continue to see the complaint being poured out. And in verse 3, it says, They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury the dead. Like these invaders of Jerusalem, our invaders are no respecter of persons. They do not value life. They are not fair. They are not honorable. They are bent on our destruction while disguising themselves as freedom. Verse 4, we are objects of contempt to our neighbors and scorn and derision to those around us. You know, to heap more on top of the sorrow and destruction, in comes the mocking. And you would think that pity should be shown the afflicted. But how often are our neighbors the opposite of neighborly? You know, they ask questions like, well, where is your God now? Or maybe they accuse, they say, what hidden sin do you have in your life that this destruction has come upon you? Or sometimes they just give really bad advice, like, well, just leave him. Now, the psalmist is naming the sorrow. He's detailing the destruction and he's calling on the holy nature of God to do something. And here is where we see him begin to use the bite of asking questions. In verse five, how long, Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will will your jealousy burn like fire? Now, the thing that popped into my head when I see the psalmist ask, how long, Lord, was, do we really want to know how long? (laughs) 
you know, I remember in my 20s, a year seemed like a really long time. And now that I'm <clears throat> not in my 20s, I perceive time a little differently. And so my question back to us is, how do you perceive a long time when you are an infinite God? So then I ask, would God have been justified in his forever anger? Because the psalmist is saying, how long will you be angry forever? And would God have been justified in his forever anger? The answer is yes. I, I want to read you something out of Deuteronomy chapter 29. I, I, I want to read the whole chapter, but I know that it's going to take too long. So Moses begins by reminding the Israelites of their 40-year journey to this place. And then he begins to challenge them. He says, carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. He's reminding the people of the covenant, what God is asking of them and what they can expect of God in return. And all is, he says, all of you are standing today in the presence of the Lord, your God, your leaders and chief men, your elders and officials, and all the other men of Israel, together with your children and your wives and the foreigners living in your camps who chop your wood and carry your water. You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord, your God, a covenant the Lord is making you this day and sealing with an oath to confirm you this day as his people. Remember their identity as his people, that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers. I am making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here, but with us today in the presence of the Lord, our God, but also with those who are not here today. So future generations. And then he reminds them, you remember how we lived in Egypt and how we passed through the countries on the way here. You saw among them their detestable images and idols of wood and stone of silver and gold. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. I want to break here and just say that's exactly what happened, by the way. And that's why God left them in destruction. But verse 19 of Deuteronomy 29, when such a person hears the words of this oath and they evoke a blessing on themselves, thinking I will be safe, even though I persist in going my own way, they will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will fall on them, and the Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. The Lord will single them out from all the tribes of Israel for disaster. And then it goes on to say that the children who follow you in later generations, that um, they will... They will suffer because of this. And the nations will ask, why has the Lord done this to this land? Why this fierce burning anger? And the answer will be, it is because this people abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. They went off and worshiped other gods and bowed down to them. Gods they did not know, gods he had not given them. Therefore, the Lord's anger burned against this land so that he brought on it all the curses written in this book. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them into another land as it is now. Okay, this is the thing (laughs) that they are living out in Psalm 79. They're living out what God promised in Deuteronomy 29. And I know that they're generations and generations later, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But they were not innocent as a people in this time. Okay. Uh, I just, the one thing that jumped out at me in verse, uh, let's see what verse, chapter 29, it says, uh, I can't find the verse, but it, when it said, um, I will be safe even though I persist in my own way. I think that pretty much sums up our culture today, don't you? I'll be safe even though I persist in my own way. I don't have to follow the rules that God has given me. And then it says later, all the nations will ask, why has the Lord done this to this land? Why the fierce burning anger? And the answer will be, it's because the people abandoned the covenant of the Lord. So you might question God's motives at times in scripture. And you might think, oh gosh, he seems mean and uncaring. But he's not. He's loving, but he is holy. And he made a promise. He made a covenant. And he always keeps up his end of the bargain. But we break ours and wonder why we're in the pickle we're in. So will God's anger last forever? Fortunately for the psalmist, no. But he is a jealous God and he doesn't want to share our worship 
or our loyalties any more than he did when he talked about it with the Israelites. So the psalmist prayer continues in verse 6 and 7. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. Now, I personally see the hypocrisy of this prayer. I know exactly why they pray it. It is easier to see the failings in others than to admit your own. See, the the psalmist is pointing out the disregard of the enemy to God's ways. But what about their own, right? But anyway, just keep reading. Verse 8, do not hold against us the sins of past generations. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Blaming the past, but asking for mercy. And mercy, of course, is the pardon of consequences that is due us. It's not me. It's not me. Well, maybe it is me, but we're desperate. That's what the psalmist is saying, okay? And all we have to do is review verses 1 through 4 to remember how desperate they are. How broken down, how vulnerable and mocked they are. Verse 9, help us, God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. So in their desperation, they are calling for help. But they got themselves into the mess in the first place. Idols and false gods and capitulating to culture. They need deliverance from their invaders. But they have it right. Because their cry for help came from a heart of repentance. Just what we hear in our song. Oh God, forgive us. You see, our fa- song reflects our time, our invaders. We want drive through faith and instant hope, our song says. But when we're truly desperate, we don't cry out to Wall Street. And we don't cry out to Hollywood or our politicians. When we've reached this level of desperation, when we are this broken, we either come to a place of rejection or repentance. And you can tell that it is a deep repentance because it is not for their pleasure or their relief that they are crying out. It is for God's glory and his name's sake. Keep reading and, and you'll see a God uh, called to God for God to avenge. They ask him to preserve them. They ask him to pay back um, their enemies. And then the psalm concludes with a further description of our identity in God And in Christ, it says, Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever from generation to generation. We will proclaim your praise. You see, we, your people, we belong to him. The sheep of your pasture, we trust and we follow him. We belong to him and we follow him. And then that promise, we will praise. We're going to make sure it's a lasting praise, that generation to generation kind of praise. And we will proclaim it. And I don't know about you, but there's no other way to proclaim it than with our mouths. So we will sing praises. We will say our praises. We will praise with our mouth. And we'll make sure it's a lasting praise. So what's next? Well, read Psalm 79 for yourself and really think about what invaders may have made their way into your holy temple. How have they been breaking down your walls? Consider what areas you have defied what God has asked of you. And then ask for his forgiveness in true repentance. And then praise his name with your mouth. And then while you're in God's word this week, let me know how you're doing. Email me, michelle at michellekneezat.com or hop on Twitter at michellekneezat or Facebook, Michelle L. Nizat, and we can talk about what you're learning. Now, before I tell you what song will be featured next week, I want to thank the premier Christian music streaming service, theoverflow.com, for pointing their subscribers to this podcast, but more importantly, pointing them to God's word through music. Now, when you subscribe to their trial, you will receive a 10-day series of devotions that I wrote based on some of my most popular podcast episodes. So I encourage you to check them out at theoverflow.com. And I also want to thank my newest subscribers to my website, like Casey from Texas and Deborah from Virginia, Renee from Hawaii, Kathy from somewhere in the U.S., Mark from Macau, Mackenzie from Florida, and Anne from Illinois. Welcome. Now, new subscribers to my website will benefit from an email that I send once a week. And in that email, you will get a weekly memory verse resource to display on your smartphone, tablet, desktop, or you can even print it out. You get an email recap of the week's episode, and you get instant access to any of the resources that I create for my episodes from time to time. It's just my way of saying 
thank you for listening. So head over to michellekneesat.com to subscribe today. Now, don't ever miss an episode of my podcast. You can subscribe directly in iTunes. And while you're there, would you leave me a written review and a star rating? This really encourages me, of course, but it helps me stay visible to new listeners. And as always, if you take the time to review my podcast, I will take the time to personally thank you right here on the podcast. Just like Jess, who writes, happy I found this podcast. What a great podcast to get a reflection on today's Christian music that I listen to. You will get hooked on this podcast. Be sure to check out her website also. Thank you, Jess. I really appreciate it. Well, that's it for this episode of More Than a Song. Next week, I will be using I Got Saved by Selah to jump into scripture. And if you liked this episode, would you mind sharing it with others? I've made it really easy. With just one click, you can share via Facebook, Twitter, or email. Just head over to michellekneesat.com forward slash 183. While you're there, I'd love to hear from you. Click on comment to join the conversation. Until next time, take time to meditate on God's word and consider his ways.